so uh, I will do a little bit more of uh, one variable kind of complex analysis at the beginning of the class today of the course, and then I will talk a bit about model theoretic consequences. And then I hope uh, from Friday on to talk about multivariable case and uh, analytic uh, uh, varieties in this setting, etc. Uh, all right. So what we did last time, again, the setting is an arbitrary or minimal structure of a real closed field, nothing, no Archimedeanness, no complex numbers, nothing like that. But all the objects are definable, even if I forget to say. And the last time we last time we proved this strong version of removal of singularities that if you have a function on the open disk, I should, yeah, this should this is the unit disk here. So if you have a continuous definable function on the closed unit disk. And you know that it's differentiable off a set of dimension one on the interior, then it's differentiable everywhere. And I looked up the connection because a lot of what we are doing in the classical setting actually can be read off a very strong removal of singularity theorem by Schiffman and another one by Bishop. But looking very quickly, I must say, I, I, I didn't have, I had a feeling that this maybe does not fit here, but it could be that it does, that I'm missing something. That it does but uh, in any way this is in the abstract setting and now we can conclude the classical so-called uh, uh, Riemann removal of singularity theorem so uh, one can say that the besides uh, the let's call it two Besides the uniformity result and the finiteness result that all minimality gives, uh, probably the main strength of all that we are doing is removal of singularities in various dimensions, in various settings. This is what all minimality gives you is a nice behavior on the frontier of sets. And you can say that as a result of that, we have plus other all minimality effects, we have the, uh, re this removal of singularity theorems. So this is the classical one here. We don't say anything new, but it's nice to see that it's true in general. F now it's an arbitrary open set into K is K differentiable. And bounded then, uh, how does one say that F is, Z zero is removable. So it means that there is some W zero in K such that I'll still call it f of z, well, f hat z, let's say, is f of z to z different than z zero and w zero otherwise, that z zero is differentiable. So it's, and of course, you don't have to look some for some w zero, this is just the limit then because it becomes continuous. This is just the limit of f as z approaches z0. So there is a limit, and this is the limit, and let me go quickly through the proof. Now we have everything, so we can do it. Uh, but yeah, all right. And again, this is all done by these auxiliary functions. And I think, yeah, all right. I'll just write it. So we write, this is very similar to classical proof. Z different than Z zero and zero is that equal to Z zero. And because F is bounded, it follows that the limit F bounded implies that the limit of H of Z as Z approach Z zero is zero. So H is K differentiable on U minus the singleton and continuous on U. And continuous on U. So 
by the removal of singularity in a simple case where the point where there is only point so by theorem h is a differentiable at u at z zero so now we just read it off because it's k differentiable it's uh so how does it work now uh Ah, yeah, and uh, and h prime of c zero is the limit of uh, f of z. No. Ah, sorry, the limit of yeah, yeah, that's what we need. It's in two steps. It's exactly uh, the limit of. Uh, h of z minus h of zero which is zero divided by z z zero as z approaches z zero but now when you do that you get exactly the limit of f of z as z approaches z zero so this has a limit at z zero so now f can be extended right so now so the function f hat which is defined to be f of z outside z0 and h prime of z0 at z0 is continuous. So again, we apply to it the, is, uh, the, the theorem from before, because now it's not only bounded. So f then is continuous now at zero it has a limit uh so differentiable again by the same theorem so f that is a differentiable at g zero so we showed that g zero is indeed removable let me do it the chris miller way i'll move here now Okay, so this result now is very powerful. It gives us the classical removal of singularity theorem. And now I'll just put the theorem. I thought I'll do the proof, but then this will be more of complex analysis. I don't want to do it. So one can prove using, using above plus the maximum principle. also the fundamental theorem that if a function is differentiable then its derivative is also differentiable yes f and again it's done via auxiliary functions like that uh, in a similar spirit but a little bit more work is k differentiable of course definable everything is definable then f prime of that is also k differentiable so of course this is when you teach complex analysis to students you tell them you see this is the main difference or a very striking difference between real functions real differentiable functions and complex differentiable functions that you automatically get infinitely uh, differentiable function just from knowing one which of course, from the point of view of model theory, extremely powerful because uh, being k-differentiable is a definable property, right? We just say a limit exists and we get for free uh, infinite behavior of the function just from knowing one differentiability, right? So people work a lot, like there is time CRM in particular setting of real functions. It's a lot of work to prove that if you are n differentiable, then you are infinitely times differentiable, or maybe even analytic. But of course, complex analysis gives it to you for free. So uh, proof, I will not, uh, I will not give the details. But it's similar at this point to what is done. I no, actually, usually people do it using. No, I think it's similar maybe to what is done classically. All right. 
So now let's uh, get the fruits of all of that. And now let's, is let's focus on isolated singularities. And now we have a nice classification, which mimics what I said happened in the classical setting for all minimal structures that there are no essential singularities. We can make sense of this. So now let's analyze isolated singularities. Okay, so the setting I'm, I want to look at now is F from U, which is K differentiable. And we want to understand what can happen at the isolated point V0. But before that, let me uh, write a general fact, general or minimal fact, which in, in, in some sense I already said in my first in the first class but i want to make it more precise so first uh, nothing to do with differentiability let f i'll do it in k but it can be in actually in any dimension the, yeah this could be actually f uh, no, I'll do it in K, sorry, sorry, no, it, it's a map into K, so uh, in R2, we don't need K, into R2, we don't need to think of it as a field, definable, Z not is a point on the frontier, let's say all, all, all my U are open, right, if I never, if I didn't say all my U's are open, is a point on the front on the closure of you it could be inside could be outside then there is v so the picture is uh, this is you and maybe possibly z0 is here so and the function is defined here so the claim is that uh, there is some neighborhood of Z0 containing Z0 such that F of V intersection U is not dense in R2. Okay. Now, f of u could be dense, and I want to point out that even with k differentiability, right? So I just uh, wave my hand. Uh, is this? No, I don't want to do that. So I want to point out that you could have in uh, in elementary extension, very, very thin, infinitesimally thin uh, strips around the x-axis, infinitesimal, whose image is dense in, in, in K, right? You can take some uh, a scaled version of, of, uh, of X, E to the, is it, uh, Alpha times x, I guess, yeah. So, and you can have even a k differentiable map e to the alpha, where alpha is uh, infinite times x is dense, right? It will be uh, actually uh, k minus zero. So, even you can have very, very narrow strips, k differentiable functions, the nicest possible, this is infinite. So, you blow it up a little bit, you go into the natural strip of e to the x where it's defined and the image is the whole of k o of k minus zero. So we are not claiming that you cannot have very, very narrow, narrow open sets of image 
uh, is dense, but once you fix a point, then you can always find the small neighborhood where the image is not dense. Okay, so proof, we basically saw that. If not, then I'll write it like this. For every W in K, let's say W different than F of Z zero, we can always, we don't care about F of Z zero in case F of Z zero is defined. There is, uh, what does it mean to say that for every V the image is dense, it means that any point in K can be approached by taking elements closer and closer and closer to Z zero. Right, it doesn't matter how small the neighborhood is, we can reach any point, not reach, but we can approach every point in K. So there is a definable path, let's say, gamma T approaching the zero in U. And we can make sure that gamma T is different than Z zero. We don't care what happens at Z zero. We don't want eventually constant function such that, yes, of gamma t approaches w. This means that uh, gamma of t, f of gamma of t approaches z0 w in the product space. If in case f of z zero is defined, I just want to remove one point. I don't care. I want to say that it's dense, okay. except maybe at uh, f of z. Well, f of z. If, if it's dense everywhere, then it's dense also at f of z zero. I just don't want the, the um, I don't want this curve to be constant. This is the only reason. And I don't assume any continuity or existence of limits. So I just remove one point from the image, and I will show that it's dense outside this point, but then it's dense everywhere. All right, but then on the product space, notice that this means that since this can be done for any W, that Z0 cross K, possibly without Z0, but as I said, it doesn't matter because once this will be contained in the closure, everything will be contained in the closure. It's contained in the closure of F restricted to you sorry the graph of f the graph of f restricted to u minus z0 right so i put i drew I, I wrote exactly the same thing on the first class all right but it's not inside the graph because uh, sorry, it, uh, yeah, it's not inside the graph because it's the fiber above Z0. So the function is not defined. I, I'm not even looking at Z0 here. So this is actually even more minus the graph of F. So it's actually in the frontier. So actually we can replace this with the frontier of uh, let me write this f restricted to u minus z0. right the closure minus the set is a frontier but now we have a problem in terms of dimension because this has dimension two it's the dimension of k this is o minimal dimension equal to two the graph of a function over an open set or over any set, two dimensional set in K has dimension two, right? It's in bijection with this. So uh, this set has dimension two, but this contradicts the fact that the frontier of an O minimal set has to have smaller dimension, right? So we have a set of dimension two inside the frontier, but the frontier should have, I'll write it over there. The frontier should have 
dimension at most one, so we get a contradiction. But my O duality and here of the dimension two set, sorry, the dimension of the frontier of dimension two that contradiction. All right, so if we get the whole fiber of dimension two in the closure, this is a typical uh, ominimal argument. I hope it makes sense. All right, so this is uh, what I need. The only fact that I will need, if you remember, this is this was the argument why you cannot have a central singularities, and as we shall see, it will translate to understanding exactly isolated points is either removable or poles. Okay, so now we are back to the to the setting, back to f from u minus z zero to k definable and k differentiable. And let's define the order of f at z zero is follow so it will be like the order with respect to zero so like the order of the zero of f so we find the order at z zero of f as follows we take a sufficiently small rem remember we, we take i'll write it like this we take r greater than zero such that the winding number, I'll say what CR is, of S around zero stabilizes. Okay, where this is the circle of radius R, circle radius R around the zero. Such that this is the same from then on. CR prime F zero for all r prime less than r i should say one thing of course for all of this to make sense i have to assume that f is non-constant near z zero but f is non-constant because otherwise we cannot even compute because f might take the value zero on the frontier on on the circle and because of the identity so let me just say that non-constant so let me remind you what involved because it's non-constant there is a neighborhood where the function does not take the value zero anywhere right and every every point is realized finitely many times so from some point on it makes sense to talk about the winding number of f around zero because zero is not a point on the image of of the circle and as we said this is a definable this is uniformly definable in r so from some point on the winding number should stabilize we we'll, we we'll look at the point where it stabilizes and this is the order of f as z0 okay so we let the order of f at z0 be this stabilized winding number around zero And now we can read everything from that. Well, let's write now what everything that we can say. All right. Let's say case one. Assume that, uh, assume z0 is removable so f is bounded near z0 and i will by abuse of notation still write f of z of z0 for the continuation 
for the continuation, which is just the limit. The analytic continuation, although it's not defined there, but now we know that there is a unique way to define it, so it makes sense to write that. And now here is what we can say uh, one, which is all the classical facts now appear if f of z0 equal to zero, then the order is bigger than zero. So the order should measure how how many times what is the multiplicity we'll see in a second and first of all we know why we have that because zero belongs to the image of dr right dr i didn't say what it is but it's clear is the is the disk and remember, we said that if you have a point W in the image of the disk, the winding number is positive. So the order of F, which is the winding number is positive, right? So I'll just remind you, we showed that this was a, a lot of work we put for that. All right. Okay. Is this, can this be seen now? Okay. If f of z zero is not zero, then the order of f should be zero, right? Because it measures how many times we are zero and the multiplicity is zero. And why is this true? Okay, I should have written it here. Because f is continuous at z0, it doesn't take the value infinitely many times. So if we shrink uh, CR sufficiently, right? So why? Since f of z0 is not zero, so f of z0 is somewhere here in the world. So if we shrink CR or DR sufficiently small, the image will be away from zero. Zero will be somewhere here and the image will be here. So zero will be outside the image. And we said this was the easy statement that if we have a point outside the image of the disk, then its winding number is zero. Remember, there was a very nice simple argument. Why? For, so I'll write it for R sufficiently small, which we already did in fact, because we already stabilized, but let's point out why we capture that. Zero is not in F of dr. So as we showed, the winding number of CR around the point, which is not in the image of the disk, is zero. So the order, Z zero. Okay. All right. Now we have to do a little bit more work, but not much. Let's see what happens when we are not. So this is so so this captures all. All right. I'll, I'll collect it later. But these are the two possibilities, right? In removal singularities, either the value is Z zero is zero, or the value is Z zero is not zero. And we have so far some answers. One, the order is positive. The second, the order is zero. And this is classical, but now we have uh, O minimality for the next step because we want, so case two, V zero is not removable. So F is not bounded near Z0. And this is the place where we should have had a split between essential singularities and a pole. But now we can prove claim. And if you, again, if you teach 
complex analysis, you remember that this is a very crucial point in showing that things are poor. Not only that F is bounded, is unbounded, and this is always the difference. There exists a limit to this, and this is plus infinity. This is a huge step between, this is the difference between a central singularity and a pole. If you can prove that, then you have a pole. But in a central singularity, this is false. It's unbounded, but there is no limit to the absolute value, even in the, in the general sense. All right, let's prove it. <coughs> And this is where O minimality. So now, even in the classical setting, this is an interesting fact. What I did before is true in the classical setting for any function. But now, well, basically, you can say because the germs of analytic functions are anyway definable in R sub n. So doing the O minimal case captures the general case. But now we have something which is only true for O minimal functions. Of course, this is not true in general. So now let's use the fact. So by the general, by the O minimal fact, there is some neighborhood of D zero and W in K such that F restricted to V the W, uh, the closure of this, does not contain, let me put W zero, does not contain W zero. And now actually it proceeds also, if you've taught complex analysis, you more or less know how it will go. Okay, so we can isolate a point such that the image of F stays away from it. But this means that you can find a radius around W zero such that no point in the image of F goes into it. So this means there is some R zero greater than zero in R such that for every F in V minus V zero, F of oh, every Z, sorry, F of Z minus W zero is less than R. Yeah. It's greater, sorry, it's greater. Right? We stay away from this disk. This is R0. The distance from W0 is zero. So now we look at an auxiliary function again. Let H of Z be equal to one over F of Z minus W0. It is K differentiable outside. It's definable on V minus V0, right? So, and it's K differentiable on Z minus Z zero, because this is never zero. But more than that, because F of Z was bounded above, was bounded below, and the absolute value of H of Z is bounded by one over R zero. But then, Z zero is a removal singularity for H. So Z zero is a removal singularity for H. All we need is that it has a limit in Z zero. So uh, there is a limit of one over f of z minus w zero as z approaches z zero, and this is an element in k. But f of z is unbounded. We haven't used it so far. Because it's unbounded, only one limit can exist, and the limit has to be zero, right? Because this absolute value of the bottom gets as large as we want because f is unbounded. So the, this limit has to be zero since f unbounded 
this limit equals zero. But if this limit equals zero, it means that f of z in absolute value had to go to infinity. Because if it had any other limit point, then we will get limit points here, which are different than zero. So from here, it follows that uh, the limit of f of z is infinity in absolute value. Okay, so first you use that it's unbounded to get the limit of this quotient to be zero, and then it means that the absolute value of f of z had to have a limit, and this limit had to be zero. Infinity. The, this limit had to be infinity. The limit of the quotient is zero, so the limit of f of z is infinity. Okay, so we proved this claim, and now we are ready to go. We can continue. So this is a good place. I'll put it just under that. So now we have F. Uh, not just unbounded in the neighborhood of Z zero. Actually, it has a limit in the, in the general sense, the absolute value goes to infinity, right? This is exactly what failed in essential singularities. So now we can continue the analysis of this case. So now let's prove. So now we show now that the order Z0 of F is negative. And we almost have it. We again define a new function. Now we actually go back to the original H but just take zero instead of W zero. So now let H of Z be one over F of Z now. Okay, or you call it H one, just to not confuse from the previous one. And now again, Z zero is isolated, is uh, isolated singularity. It's uh, it's, uh, uh, we can assume that there is a small enough neighborhood where zero is not obtained. So uh, F of Z, right? So we can take, we might have to shrink CR so that zero is not obtained there, but we can always do it by the identity, by the identity theorem. So we can assume by shrinking Z that it's isolated singularity and, uh, and the extension of H of Z is zero or is zero is an analytic uh, continuation. It's the k differentiable continuation. But now we're exactly in case one because we have h and h of z zero is zero. So by case one. The winding number of CR of H is zero is positive, but because of the multiplicate, but multiplicative the additivity rule or the multiplicative rule, multiplicativity rule, which implies because this is one over F of Z, that the winding number of F of Z is zero, which is minus the mining number of one over f of z at zero is negative, right? So the order of f at zero is negative. So let's summarize what we have now. We actually, we have all the possible behaviors of uh, analytic, a K differentiable function in an ominous setting in an isolated singularity. And we have even a nice uh, 
way to detect that. And so now to summarize. Just Z0 is isolated. We have two possibilities. Either the order of F Z0 is greater or equal to zero. And this is true if and only if Z0 is removable. And equality holds. And equality holds if and only if in abuse of notation, I'm writing F of Z0 is different than zero. So the order is zero if and only if the function is not zero. And two, the order of F always, always integer number, right? And not standard, non-standard integer. The order is always a standard integer number. This is crucial. Is less than zero. It's an only if, how shall I write that? Yeah, let's just say that f of n goes to infinity, which is a strong property of unboundedness, a strong variation on unboundedness. All right. Now we are getting closer and closer to power series expansions. Uh, any questions on that? So really, this is all very streamlined. It's nothing now besides the initial fact on all minimality, which is really an exercise. Uh, the rest is just using what we have already and removal of singularities again and again and again. This is crucial, of course. Okay, so you go to a function, you go to a point, you compute the eventual uh, winding number, and you know exactly what the behavior of the function is, right? You can read it off the winding number. And now we have something which is very close to power series expansion. So we are still under the situation of Z0 and isolated singularity, right? F defined in a punctured neighborhood of it. So Theorem, let n be the order of f at z0, then there exists a definable k differentiable. So let me put the setting, the setting is f from the punctured this punctured open set into k k differentiable everything definable k differentiable then there exists a definable k differentiable function on the whole of u including z0 which is not zero at z0 such that f of z is g of z times z minus z zero to the end. Right, we pulled out the largest power and let me just write, notice that n could be negative. E.g. if n equal to minus two, then f of z is one over z minus z zero square times an analytic function which does not vanish at z zero. Yes, z zero is not zero. Of course, on the punctured uh, set in this case. Yeah, I should say for all where it's defined. For that different than z0 because it might not be defined. Well, it is not defined the way it's written. All 
All right. Uh, I want to leave this one up. Oh. No, actually. All right, we'll see. Um, Actually, this is all that I need now. I don't need that anymore. This has all the information we need. So actually, maybe I'll leave this up. This is stronger than that, right? It implies that in particular. So, ah, sorry. Okay, I didn't do it the right order. Never mind. Let's write the proof of that. And then, well, I, I want to do a little bit more complex analysis, and then we'll say we'll do some model theory. All right. So, what does it mean? It means that the event, the order is n. So the eventual uh, winding number is n. So around zero, right? This is the eventual winding number, which stabilizes is n. But now we just note, and it's, you know, note that we have another function with the same winding number, which is z minus z zero, n is also n. So in for n, uh, we just need to do it for, for positive n, because uh, we can, by the inversion law, we can know it for negative n. And then you really just need to know it for z minus z zero and use the additivity to get it. And just easy to see that this is just n. This is just one. So when you multiply it by itself, you get n. So together, we get the, the winding number of f of z by z0. And 0 is 0 by the activity. All right. But now we have this and we look at the quotient, call it G of Z. The order of G of Z at zero is zero, which means that G can be extended to become K differentiable at Z zero with non-zero value. So by what, so W or the order, the order of G of Z, at zero is zero. Sorry, like this. The order of G of Z at Z zero is zero implies that G can be extended such that G of Z zero is not zero. So here we have so Z equals to Z minus Z zero to the end times G of Z, where G of Z zero is one. All right, so now when we have isolated singularities, we can write them like that. And now take derivatives and we immediately get the basic facts of complex analysis. And there is another way to see the order. The order is exactly the first time that the derivative becomes non-zero. So, Thus, corollary, the order of f at z0 is the smallest and in z such that f of n at z0 is not zero. But I, when I write this, of course, it makes no sense because it's not defined. So what I mean that the derivative is analytic at Z zero and non-zero, right? The extension, I mean. The, so there is an extension, the extension of F to Z zero. And how do you do? You just compute. You just do the, the multiplic, multi, you know, the multiplication rule, and you see that it's exactly the place. Just, just the derivative. The proof is just take a derivative of uh, Z. G of Z using the fact 
the g of g zero. So here you uh, you allow n to be negative. So you think does it work? I I wrote it and I didn't. I wonder. If, no, maybe not. Huh? It will not work because derivative will get smaller and smaller. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. It doesn't work. You're right. You're right. I I was too. So let's assume right, right. Yeah. Assume f is uh, k differentiable. I agree. It doesn't work. Uh, thanks. It's the smallest natural number. Yes, the smallest natural number. Otherwise, there's no meaning. Also, there is no meaning for that, right? right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This has no meaning otherwise. Sorry. I was hasty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <coughs> well, you can also consider one over f in the case that it's right. not defined. Right. Yes. All right, so now we can answer something that I put on the board in the first class. And I ask whether we can have hope to have, just like we have in non standard structures, we have x to a negative to a, an infinite power on the real line, on the R line. This makes sense if you work in a model of uh, Rx, for example, then in the elementary extensions, you will get. Uh, infinite powers you can get uniform functions functions defined on the all of r with uh, unbounded power not natural not standard size number and now this cannot happen in the all minimal setting for k differentiable functions so as a corollary for alpha z to the alpha cannot be definable Defined in a neighborhood of zero and uh, neighborhood of zero as a k differentiable function. Uh, this is not extremely precise, but you cannot have because when you divide by, you want to write it as z minus z zero to the nth times a function n standard n times a function which is, does not vanish, and this is impossible to do clearly for anything like z to the alpha, but I want to make this answer also something that uh, Patrick asked yesterday. In definably complete structure, this is not a problem. You can do that. Why? So in contrast, so we can say non-standard analysis because you can take the structure, let's say the real field, together with some f let's call it fn where fn is z to the n from uh, uh, z to the n from c to c and now take the ultra power of this the ultra product of this so you take the ultra product of this with some filter how do you write this this over some filter and you will get a power an infinite power of a k differentiable function. Why will it be k differentiable? Because each one of these is holomorphic. So this is part of the theory. You will get in elementary extension, not elementary extension, in the ultra product, you will get a non standard power of z, which will have all the properties which f to the f to the n have had on this in the standard structure. And this will be definably complete because each one of them is definably complete. And the final completeness should go through. The I think yeah to go through in the Cartesian product in the ultra product so it's not a, an inherent property of k differentiable functions this is what I want to say we are not doing non-standard analysis and we are not doing just theory of k differentiability right so here z to the n star will be k differentiable everywhere actually is a polynomial from this point of view is k differentiable on the ultra product of C right, over D. Over U, I guess. U is those. Sorry. Let's write it here. Okay, so it shows that first of all, this is where, for example, the general theory of uh, holomorphic function fails in the general setting, but even in uh, restricted settings, like definably complete settings, this will not work. This is a very typical feature of O minimality, what we are getting here. 
Uh, all right, let's continue. Here, here, here. Let's talk about power series expansion. So it's not expansion, but power series associated to uh, so theorem if S uh, is K differentiable. Uh, on the whole of you, Z0 is in U, then what do we have? We have, uh, yeah, for every, and in Z, we can look at F of Z minus the power series expansion, the Taylor expansion, F of K at Z0 divided minus z0 to the k, k goes from 0 to n. And uh, what we can say, we don't have, we don't say that it approaches it, but what we said is that the order of this at z0 is bigger than n. And if the order is negative, if f, uh, uh, this is, one, two, if Z zero is a pole, then we still have a power series, but just we have the Laurent extension. And the same thing is true, but I will not write the formula for that. Then we get F of Z minus the sum K starts from the order of F. So it's some negative number. When, and I'll just write here a k z minus z zero to the k. And the reason is that the derivatives, it's almost immediate because you will get that the derivative at z zero will be of higher and higher order. Uh, so you'll have, no, not the derivative, what, yeah, the derivative which vanish will be of higher, of higher order. So now it follows quite easily from that that this is true. Yes, yes, sorry, yes. Sorry, yeah, I will not write that. It's stupid. Can you see now? All right. So now, sorry, for every n, yes, yes, yes. For every n, no, greater or equal than the order. And this is for every n in n. Thanks. Yes, yes. It follows that although the power series does not approximate, although we, I, can, I also could write, could have written some sense of approximation, but it's not a real approximation in non standard setting. So back again to what was discussed yesterday in the problem in the question session. Uh, so power series do not approximate in, we don't have any hope to get approximations in general saturated settings, but we still have that the power series captures the essence of F in a neighborhood of F in the sense of that the map F uh, goes to the power series. So this is now a formal power series. Right, this is totally formal. We're not claiming any convergence. So this is just an element 
in K, I guess this polynomial ring. And this is injective. It's yours. From where, yeah, from objective from where, right? From germs of uh, uh, K differentiable, definable, right? Definable. It doesn't matter which structure. K differentiable function uh, at in the neighborhood, of course, when I say at the neighborhood of the So if a function has all its derivative zero, it has to be zero, not because we get approximation, basically because of that. If we have a non-constant function, then we can always pull out the power. And from some point on, the derivatives will be non-zero. So if all the derivatives are zero of a k-differentiable function, it is locally constant. Right, i.e., if sk of z0 is zero for all k, then f is locally constant. F is locally zero. Mu z0. Which again will be the contradiction here because here all the derivatives will be zero of this non standard power. All the derivatives will be zero, but this is not a non zero function. This is not a constant. This is not a constant function. So again, this is not a feature of, of uh, general theory of uh, differentiability, but this is very much all minimality. Okay, we can now prove well, we could have done it already earlier. That entire functions are polynomial. And basically, the proof was already done in class number one. Uh, based on Uville theorem. The fact that we have no poles, no essential singularities. So I will not even write the proof, I will just write it. So the theorem is one every definable k differentiable entire function right so it's a now it's an entire function it's not on an open set is polynomial there are no new entire functions right so but also the uh, softer version of that is f from k minus finitely many points to k is k differentiable, definable, of course, then it is k rational. Uh, Okay. Z, I guess. Okay. Rational. And the proof, just see the class, what I sketched in class one. See, I did it over, the, over C, but all we needed is one, there is no essential singularity. Second, uh, uh, Liouville theorem, right? We just use no essential singularity. Well, there's no, we didn't have a meaning even for essential singularities that uh, singular singularities are poles at worst, let's say. Poles at worst plus UV, which we proved in this set. You just go to infinity, you say that 
we have also at infinity a pole you do the usual game you look at one over f f i forget f of one over z and uh, you get a bounded function blah 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 and you get a polynomial all right so so far i really just did complex analysis develop complex analysis plus from time to time theorems like this which are even in the classical setting are all minimal results but a lot of what i did was just to show that complex analysis can be developed uh, in this setting and now i want to go back to model theory and talk more about the fruits that we can get from that because of this working in an, in a general setting let's go back and do more model theory See what we can harvest from all this still for one variable function we're just doing one variable function so far and i remind you all the time that we developed in particular a theory for k differentiable functions in the lipschitz robinson model which had new holomorphic holomorphic functions which are not coming from c just the theory of formal power series Remember, there we just worked with formal power series restricted to some, in, actually, yeah, they had even much more than what I put on the board. So this kind, these kind of results cannot be transferred from, uh, from uh, the real model, right? So all that we did is, I think, the only way you can prove that the whole theory of complex analysis, this local theory and what I have here, still works in this Lipschitz-Robinson model. Okay, so um, model more model theory. Again, R is an O minimal expansion now of an arbitrary R for now. We'll go back to the classical setting in a second. Expansion of some real closed field R. One. Which in particular it's true over C, of course, over the standard real. If F is a definable family, T can be come from anywhere, just a parameter set is a definable family of K differentiable function, entire function. ft from the whole of k to k then not only each one of them is polynomial but there is a bound on the power of the polynomial then there is standard n in n such that every ftz is a polynomial a k polynomial Of degree at most n. Why is that? So let, let me do it once. I mean, I, I for people who are familiar with model theory, you know that. But let me just wave my hands. How you show something like that from what we did? Assume not. Assume no bound. So in sum for, for every n, there is an FTN. It has to be polynomial, right? Because we already agreed that every entire function is polynomial uh, of degree greater or equal to n. Uh, n, little n. And now we write the type. So I apologize for people who don't come from model theory, P of T, which says that for every A0 up to AN, uh, F T of that 
is different than the polynomial k goes from no yeah k goes from zero to n of a k is equal to k right we do it for every n in n this is a first order statement so the type consists of infinitely many first order statements which are continuous by this fact because any finite number of them can be realized actually in the model that we work with so in r star extending r f of t star t star realizing p will be an entire function definable in an all minimal structure which is not a polynomial k i guess k star differentiable on k star which is the uh, real closure of r star but not a polynomial but not polynomial and this is contradiction so whenever you can associate to definable functions in some sense standard objects like this in any model this always has a uniformity content of this nature right this is the power of doing things in arbitrary setting and now here is a question that I don't know the answer to. Uh, Assume that we knew by some magic that the function, so assume uh, again, f of t, t in t, uh, definable family of k differentiable function, but now on the unit disk, let's say, to k. Such that we know somehow that each f of t is a polynomial. Such that each f of t, f t, z is a k polynomial. It's not clear how to identify polynomials when they are not entire so the question is there a uniform bound on the degree of ft which equivalently we are asking is it true that in elementary extensions all these f of t's will also be polynomial right if there was a uniform bound we can write a statement saying that each f of t is one of these family of these polynomials so uh, to ask this question is the same as asking is the same true in every elementary extension is there a way to understand the uh, polynomial to to somehow say what it means to be polynomial in uh, in our language in any structure actually i don't care and now here is one of my favorite examples which does not, of course, it's not a counterexample, but I like this. By R2 Piekos. And this is a standard uh, example. So I hope I'm getting it right. Is it here? Is it here? Okay, so you will correct me if I don't get it. Let A N and in N be. A sequence of complex numbers in you just choose them arbitrarily in the half ball unit ball 
And now you find a function of two variables to be the infinite sum and goes from one infinity z to the n and you multiply it by longer and longer products of the form and each term you go longer and longer And now what R2 shows is, first of all, that this function is a two variable function is definable in R sub N. So it's in fact analytic in both variables, I believe. So yeah, I'm writing two B. So one F is definable in R sub N. What is the domain of this function? Yeah, I think so. It means on d half, yes, thanks. d half square okay. to see. And now what, notice what happens every time you plug in. Uh, let me see, well, how does it work? Yeah, once a n goes into the picture, it kills all the rest of the terms. So whenever you plug in for W some AI, from some point on the rest of the, of, the, of the series vanishes automatically. So for every plugging in of AI, you get a polynomial of higher and higher degree. Right, so hmm. I'll write it here anyway. So you do get inside D half, a family of polynomials of bounded order, but of course, we don't, they are not all polynomials. This is the point in this case. So for W equals to a n, uh, F of the W is a polynomial of degree, I think n minus one, if I'm not mistaken, because you kill off the ends and up. Uh, sorry, uh, let's put a hint here. So we get a family of functions which contains polynomials of unbounded degree. But of course, it doesn't answer the question because whenever W is not a n, this is not a polynomial, it's an infinite series, right? So, but for W different than an I, F. W is not a polynomial. So the question was, what happens if somehow you have only polynomials? Still, I, I like this. So it's good to remember that you could have within a family uh, unbounded. Uh, Suppose you take a countable subfield of uh, the complex number, and you take for the uh -huh. case an enumeration of, of the points in that uh, field. Uh, <laughs> but of course, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so you take all the points in D half. And D half. But I don't that, know. That you, you, that subfield, and you, you, yeah. The problem is that the subfield is, I suppose, is not a. Does not convert. Maybe you want the field to be maybe a model of R sub n, maybe in a countable model. But you cannot have a countable model. No, but maybe maybe it's a good point. You you take this function only. And now you look at the countable model. Well, over it is the well. It is actually the well. Yeah. No, if you take a you take a countable substructure, yeah, maybe you're right. You can take a countable. It's not. I'll say, you take a countable substructure, and uh, then you count. You put in the ah no, but you have first to put the yeah, f and then you to have take. To do a similar, you have to do a construction like a dovetail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but so maybe possible. I don't yes, know. yes. So I, I think this question will be, maybe it's possible, but this question will be more interesting. Ah, yeah, I guess maybe in some sort of saturated setting, but I think, yeah, maybe you're right that this is possible, that this is possible. Maybe not. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's do some more. Because
Okay, so more two. Is this two? I don't know, maybe three. No, this model theory. Yeah, so in the same way, if f of t, t in t, is a definable family of k differentiable functions, h from ut minus some point zt. So in a family, in a varying family of punctures, uh, uh, open sets, then there is a bound. Then one, there is an n such that for every t, either the absolute value of the order at zt of f is bounded by n or ft is locally constant or ft is locally constant. So this is like uh, Tam's theorem, I guess, or k differentiable function. Right, there is it exactly the same because we have uniform bound because we can work in arbitrary structure if not the order is definable using let's say the winding number so if not we will get in elementary extension uh, uh, we realize a type which says that f is not locally constant but the order is different than n for every n we, we write countably many formulas like this so this is exactly as before the proof by compactness uh, this oh, same proof oh. by compactness using the fact that the order is definable uniformly, the winding number is definable, the order is definable. All right. Three, under the same set, in the same setting, as in two, let's write that, also we write this, the sum of a k t, at z of t, z minus z t to the k, k goes from the order of z zero f of t to infinity, be the associated Laurent series to each of f of t because the order is bounded. So actually we can go from n, right? We can go from minus n here. We have a bound n all the order is below that, so it's above that. Be the associated, be the Laurent series associated to f of t. Then, for every k greater or equal to n, the map t goes to a k t z t. I guess I should have f here somewhere, but we assume that we work with f of t. So the coefficient maps, the family for each k, the coefficient, the case coefficient family uh, uh, function is definable. Right, we just take some limits using the fact that f t is equal to z minus z t to the n t times some g t of that. And then for example, the first coefficient is the limit of g t at z zero. The second coefficient, you take the derivative and then you take the limit 
etc., etc. Right? So using limits at z zero, we can actually have uh, the family of coefficients, the functions again, which associate for every k, the k coefficient in the Noron series to f of t is definable. So now let me go back to C to the classical setting and remind you what we get from that. back to k equals c i'll remind you that when we take simple closed curve here of this integral can be computed as the sum of residues of the function inside the interior Let's say the function has finitely many residues, finitely many poles, sum of residues of F in the interior of T. Now, the residue, remind you, is exactly the first negative coefficient. So it's a minus one zero. Which means that actually we can uniformly define right in any minimal structure. You don't need it just means that contour integrals of in complex analysis, you don't really need to do integration. You just need to know what happens at poles. So now we have. So if f of t, t in t is a definable family of uh, k holomorphic functions of c, now we can write holomorphic functions. Functions. Uh, how should we write this? Uh, ft minus ft, this is finite, so possibly outside finitely many points. And to see. And ct, and this should be ut, sorry, not the same u. Everything, uh, everything uh, moves. CT inside UT, a definable family of simple closed curves, uh, definable family of simple closed curves, then the function which assigns to every T the integral, the contour integral, then t maps to well i could do one over two pi or without one over two pi this is a constant ct ft z z is definable why you go to interior of ct you see how many poles or how many uh yeah we're just interested in poles poles you have there you calculate a minus one and you sum all of this is definable right using what we call a minus one t at uh, our right in abusive notation at f of t at the point of f of t computing the residue is definable uh, so multiplying by one over two pi by two pi is definable two pi i so uh, the whole thing is definable
Like we don't need to go like in, uh, you don't need to go to Fafi enclosure or anything when you compute contour integrals. It's not about Riemann integration really. It's about the behavior it poses. Okay. The last thing I want to do in the one variable case, which is, I like it. I don't know it yet how to use it. Let's see, I will start it now. And if I need, I will continue on Friday before I move to the several variable case. So, behavior at boundary point it plays an important role in the multivariable case. Behavior at boundary points. So what is the setting here? Now we move to the general setting. Assume F from U to K is definable and K differentiable. And I wanna look at what happens on the boundary of and Z zero belongs to the boundary of U. Now, in general, just by O minimality, in same spirit as the O minimal fact, we know that there are only finitely many points that you could have infinitely many limits, right? If you take a generic point on the boundary, we can show that there, are, there is a unique limit as you approach it, but remember always the function uh, x over y, at zero, zero has infinitely many limits in general, in the reals. So you can have functions which have infinitely many points, infinitely many limits in DCL of zero, if you want points on the boundary, but infinitely many points. When F is K differentiable, it always has a limit. It always has a limit at every point, possibly infinity. Then for every, right? For all the limit of F as Z approaches Z zero exists, but exists in K union infinity, including this possibility at every point of the, on the boundary. Uh, maybe I can wave my hands over the proof and try to explain. So let me remind you the uh, maximum principle, no, the identity theorem, sorry which was proved using the maximum principle. Recall when F closed disk now, closed K is definable, continuous and K differentiable in the interior, in the interior, then it cannot take a constant value anywhere, including on the frontier, locally. Then F inverse of W, let's say non-constant, non-constant. Uh, non I always forget to put this. Is finite on the on the, the frontier of D, the boundary of D as well. Because the argument we had, I remind you, we said let's say it is infinite anywhere. We move, we play it here, and then remember we, we multiply 
we do this trick when we multiply four times we move it we turn it around and then we get we use the maximum principle and the maximum principle is fine with the frontier as well you don't need only to do it where the points are differentiable so this is true so it means that even on the frontier we cannot take any value infinitely many times this is a point and now assume that we had in w0 infinitely many values infinitely many limit points so now i will wave my hands assume f had infinitely many limit points uh, as z approaches z0 first of all f is finite to one in the interior f is finite to one on u because it's k differentiable by the identity theorem it's non-constant so we can choose a neighborhood not a neighborhood possibly a slice neighborhood so by replacing you just choose the value that you, you partition so are you to finitely many sets on which it is injective use definable choice by u1 in u we'll get something on which an open set we may assume f is injective on you right so if we had something like that we might have to go to a set like this but this will be the subset on which f is injective and it realizes inside this set infinitely many uh, and has infinitely many limits inside u1 why because you partition it to finitely many through one of them you should have infinitely many uh, limit points such that f still has infinitely many limit points moreover you can even make sure that the derivative of f is non-zero on u1 because again the derivative can be zero only finitely many often only a finitely many times the derivative is not zero and now we look at the image consider f of u1 in some w open set remember it's an open map and on this open set we have a whole area on the frontier which comes from z0 so these limit points will be on the image on the frontier of u1 right so this is the limit point of f at z0 will appear somewhere on the frontier of w but now take the inverse map the inverse map because the derivative is not zero the inverse map it's easy to see will be itself k differentiable you just look at the jacobian you you multiply the jacobian of f plus the jacobian of its inverse and it has to be identity so if one is in c the other one is in c so f inverse from w into u1 is k differentiable but now it sends an infinite set to one point to z0 which is it means that f inverse had to be the constant map right and f inverse okay so you have to uh, well you have to say that there is a neighborhood on which f extends you can take a generic point here so I'm, I'm i'm waving my hand you take a generic point here at the generic point f inverse has a limit in a whole neighborhood so by moving possibly to some smaller set sends uh, an infinite subset of the frontier of w to z0 but then it's exactly a contradiction to the identity theorem so it means that f0 f inverse had to be constant so this is not possible because it's invertible 
all right, sorry, I went a little bit fast. So, so actually functions have nice behavior on the frontier, K differentiable functions at every point on the frontier. Right, I should have said that maybe this point, one of these points is infinity, but we can always ignore infinity because it's just one point. So we can just look at the rest of the, of the values or you look at one over F, it's not hard to handle the case where uh, the limit is infinity. All right. Does it follow that F actually extends continuously to the closure? Okay, the so this is a good question. And now comes the question that I wanted to ask. I asked Chris. So it does extend from one side, but what happens if your open set is like that? This is outside the open set. So here's a question which I don't know the answer to. Assume that you have, even in C, a definable function, which is holomorphic on like a, this version of the analyst. So here's another open question. Assume, F from the unit disk minus, uh, how do we call it, the interval minus half half, right cross zero. This is what I mean. Is K differentiable and bounded? Is definable in some omnibus structure, holomorphic. Now let's do it classically and bounded. It has a limit from this direction. It has a limit from this direction, but it might not be the same limit, right? So I, I was not, hmm. yeah, this was not precise what I said there. Uh, where is it? Yeah, this is if Z zero, if U is definably connected near Z zero, I should say that, I'm sorry. Otherwise, when U is definably connected near this yeah you have to allow situations like that where you have possibly two limits we know right take land z in the slit plane then you get different uh, different limits when you go from one side or when you go from the other side so and this is definable but now assume that it's continued it's definable outside of that and bounded uh, can is F differentiable, right? So can this be removed? So I mean, does it have a limit necessarily? Should it be the same limit? If, it, if, it, if we could, uh, if we knew that it had the same limit, then it will be, we'll have a continuous extension and then it will be K differentiable by what we showed before. But I don't know, I don't know. I, I, I don't know the answer to that. All right. so. I'll start next time the multivariable case. I, it will be more phenomenology, as uh, Lau says, with less proofs. But uh, hopefully, I'll get to the so called definable chow. So it will at least reach a level that when Zimmerman starts his talk, you will know what he's talking about.